Generally, when you say you're going to be studying prophecy of last days or last things, people's minds immediately go to, okay, we're going to be studying the book of Revelation. Uh, they might realize that Ezekiel and, and Daniel have things to say about the, the end of times as well, uh, about the tribulation and the second coming. But to have a good understanding of the last days, you don't just need to think of the, what we call the apocalyptic scriptures, so those prophecies of the rapture and tribulation, you need to understand what is going on now. You have to know where you are to know where you're going. Because honestly, we are in the last days. I wake up surprised every morning that the Lord hasn't come and got us see so many things that have fallen in place uh, to set the stage for where, where the book of Revelation goes. So to have a good understanding of where we are, to know where we're going, we need to look at prophecy that applies to this current time. And so a good place to look is actually in what the Lord Jesus said while he was here on this earth. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 13. Now, a lot of people, when they think of Jesus' prophecy of the last times, uh, they might think of Matthew 24. But he said things that were applicable and important to understand where we are right now actually uh, in Matthew 13. It's a series of parables and he makes it clear in this, in this conversation that he has with the people and with the apostles that those that belong to him should be able to understand what he is saying. He speaks in parables to the people because if it is not that they belong to him, then it's not really for them to understand. So the first parable he gives in chapter 13 begins in verse 3. It says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell in stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I'm sure just many of you have heard this passage preached before, referring to the, the spreading of the gospel, how that some people will receive the gospel gladly and uh, will get excited about it, and they will seem to get involved in church and be part of, of what's going on. They, they begin to reflect a Christian life, but then the, the troubles of the earth come and they really don't have any foundation. They're not really rooted in Christ. They're just excited about the things they've heard uh, and feel good about, you know, Jesus taking away sin and, and, and these things. And they, because they don't have that, that deep root, they're not really invested in Christ, they do not last. Uh, some people, of course, in, as he first mentions in this parable, you know, the seed of the gospel gets sown, but the birds come and, and eat the seed, and so there is no, no 
um, yield. There's no gain from the sowing of that seed. And then, of course, he mentioned some uh, being cast among the thorns and the thorns choking them out. Uh, what the Lord is relating here, and it's correctly preached uh, concerning the, the, the spread of the gospel and, and the way that, that it yields in this world, the people's uh, reception to it or lack of reception and uh, the, the way that uh, things occur to uh, resist the gospel, but this is actually a prophetic scripture. He was telling us that as his disciples went out and shared the gospel, these are the things that will occur. This is how people will react to it. Uh, this is uh, how people, uh, how it will be resisted. You know, the birds of the air is a good reference to Satan and his demons coming and stealing up the, 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 the seeds before they can even begin to take root. Well, as soon as we go out sowing the gospel, we find that Satan and his demons are resisting us. They're trying to um, obstruct that seed of the gospel from even having a chance to take root. We see also that some people get caught up uh, in the concerns of the world. Uh, they meet trial and tribulation and it doesn't uh, take root. Uh, or they um, finally get into the lusts of their own flesh. All of this is very accurate when it's preached and taught. This is what happens when we spread the gospel. But he was giving us a prophetic picture showing how the gospel would go out into the world and the things that would occur that would lead us to where we are now. And you see, as we've gotten into what we consider the last days, you know, initially you saw a lot of people uh, reacting positively to the sharing of the gospel, the book of Acts being the history of the early church and the history of the, the sharing of the gospel by those original uh, disciples. And you see people coming in by the hundreds to get saved. And, and we've seen times throughout history where there were good responses to the gospel. But we also see all the time throughout history and even in our present age where you'll get somebody, they come, they hear a message, uh, they go down and profess that they're receiving Christ, they're committing uh, to join the church, work in the church, what have you. And then the next thing you know, they're gone. And that's the picture he wanted to paint for us. We have a progression or um, a picture of how the gospel would be spread and what would take place leading us up to these last times. And now more and more in these last days, we're seeing less of the acceptance of the gospel, the, the, the deep roots taking place, people really becoming uh, invested in Christ and his kingdom and uh, going forth and themselves sharing the gospel. Moving along uh, to verse 18, the Lord gives us, um, I'm sorry, not 18. Look at my notes a little better here. Uh, 24. The Lord uh, gives us uh, another parable that has to do uh, with the, the, the sowing of the gospel. Now he starts out in verse 24, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? 
But he said, no, that's why you gather up the tares. You also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Here again is another parable, which I'm sure you've heard uh, taught or preached in church. Uh, referring to how the gospel would be spread and sown and there would be a, a great response to it. The wheat would spring up, the wheat would be good, but in amongst the wheat would be uh, weeds. Uh, tares often being a, a plant that looks similar to wheat, but it does not have actual fruit at its head. Here again, the Lord is speaking prophetically. The, the first thing he says in sharing this parable is the kingdom of heaven. Now it's important to understand that what the Lord is referring to, we are, as the church, the universal, part of the kingdom of God. Now we've got time periods Phases in which we see the kingdom of God acting in a different way. You know, eventually we're going to have his thousand year rule on earth. That is, that is going to be his kingdom on earth. But even now that he has his kingdom in heaven, we the church are, are his kingdom, part of his kingdom here on earth. We're to be to be serving him and working for him and representing him and having a relationship with him. We are part of his, his government, his economy. We're to be not just representing him by going out and sharing the gospel, but we are supposed to be a representative force in encouraging the world to operate as by his government. Even though evil is very powerful in the world, we are supposed to be trying to be a force for good, to represent what his law should be and how man should behave here on earth. So we are his kingdom operating on earth right now. And it's important to understand that, to understand what he's talking about. In this kingdom that exists right now, this portion of his kingdom, we are to be out sowing the good seed. We're out, supposed to be out sharing the gospel. It is the commission that he gave us just before he ascended into heaven. You know, go forth into all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be growing his kingdom. We're supposed to be Sowing the good seed of the relationship that we have and how wonderful and beneficial and right that it is to other people that they can come into that good kingdom. Now, in this parable, he demonstrates the sowing of that good seed of the gospel as the sowing of wheat. It's prophetic in nature because... When Christianity first began to go out amongst the earth, you, you, you had the people that received it gladly, but you also had those that were resistant to it. Of course, the, the, the Jewish religious leaders would have been resistant to it as they would have been resistant to Christ himself. Initially, the uh, Roman government was very resistant to it. They didn't want some new belief, particularly belief in someone that they said was their king, to rise up and there to be another rebellion. But it, in just a little bit of time, as far as God's timetable works, you had Satan, who's, who's very slick, and likes to take the things that God makes and twist them and corrupt them. Remember in the book of Genesis, when he tempted Eve, what did he do? He took what God had said and twisted it to sow seeds of doubt. 
when he tempted Christ, what did he do? He took what the Bible said and twisted it and manipulated it as part of his temptation of Christ. Of course, Christ quoted it back to him correctly in the right context and the right interpretation. But, but Satan, while he's very slick and has his tricks, uh, he gets a little one-dimensional and keeps trying to use these tricks over and over and over. And in the case of the spread of Christianity, it seemed that in our history, the more it was persecuted, the more that true Christians dug in and said, yes, you know, this. my Lord went through persecution, my Lord was executed, of course he rose again, but you know, I love, I love my Lord and I consider, you know, as the Apostle Paul said, you know, I consider myself blessed to be able to suffer for, for my Lord, to be in chains and bondage and, and, and if need be to lay down my life. And this actually kind of fueled the spread of Christianity. And most importantly, the strength of the church. People being uh, confirmed that they were walking in the pathway of the Lord because of the resistance they were receiving and, and, and being uh, that much more committed to it uh, because uh, he had said they would, would have some persecution. You know, they, they hated me while I was in this world the world is also going to hate you. Can I add something right there that I remember from church history, and that is the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It was the seed of the church, I should say. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yeah, you know, when, when you've got people that are so committed to this one they call Lord and to his teaching, and it's making a positive change in their life that they're excited to share with you. And you see that positive change in, in, in their life. It makes people say, hey, what do they have that I might need, that I might want? And that's, that's really what you saw happening in the Christian church. But Satan, being the sneaky little bugger he is, began to sow his own seeds of something that appeared like Christianity, that appeared to be like the Church of Christ. And in that sowing, he then had infiltrating into the body of Christ those that appeared to be his, but we're not. I'm sure those that of you have been in church for some time have seen where as the church grew, you had those that came in that looked really good for a while, but the next thing you know, they are sowing discord among the members of the church. They are uh, actually being a drain on the church. They're resisting what the church is to be about. And that's what the Lord was telling us, is that as my church grows, as the followers of me uh, grow in number, there's going to be those that come in that appear to be like you. You know, you're, you're the good seed that, that grows into the wheat. You're, you're bringing forth a, a, a yield, multiplying after, after your kind, but there's going to be those that come in that look like you, but they are not of you. Uh, they are uh, sown by the enemy, and they are, you know, actually being a, a drain on the resource, the, the land that the wheat's growing in, and uh, they are not fruitful. And we've seen that throughout church history, but it seems like it has gotten ridiculous. Really, I have seen people in my time that, that I mean, they appear to be the thing out witnessing on the streets and, and um, uh, preaching and teaching in the church. And, but it wasn't long before 
you start to notice things are right and they turn or not right. And, and it turns out that they're actually working behind the backs of Christians, particularly the Christian leadership, carrying rumors and sowing discord. And, and in one case, having a that I would call having affairs uh, with, with people in the church, breaking up not only the church, but, but families within the church. And that's the way that Satan works. And, and we see it again and again and again. There's plenty of uh, evidence of, of people that appear to be Christians that appear to be part of his church, Christ's church. Right now, you can, you can flip through television channels and see those that appear to be, be Christians. Uh, starting their own little churches and growing quite, quite wealthy. Any thoughts or questions on the uh, wheat and the tear? Can it just be like, I mean, could it not be as simple as just like the end of times where God gathers the weeds and casts them in the lake of fire and gathers the Christians and takes them home? That's a good point. He actually it tells us right there in that passage, he says, uh, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers. And that is another part of this prophetic passage is that Christ is telling us there is a time coming when he is going to gather what is his. He's going to take it to him, you know, in this case, we going into the barns, but in our case, us going into heaven with him. But yes, the tares, those that appear to be false, just like uh, any person that doesn't belong to Christ in the world that's clearly a boogerhead, <laughs> uh, they will be sent to their judgment, the judgment being fire. That's a good point. That is a prophetic statement in this parable. So, um, a person who, let's say, has gotten involved with a not, uh, someone who says they're teaching the gospel, they're teaching you, but they've never really taught that person the true gospel, does that person have an opportunity to get saved? Like, you know, where it says, this person's never heard of the gospel. Does that, would that person, like, if it was over here, and I was teaching, but I was teaching all the false prophets and God or whatever, I wasn't teaching the true God, will that person have an opportunity to get saved or they won't? No. Uh, Satan works hard uh -huh. to obstruct the gospel of Christ. And one thing that you can see that's taking place in the world right now is how he is working with people at younger and younger ages. Mm -hmm. um, our school system here uh, has got a lot of, of good people in it, a lot of Christian people in it. Uh, being that we are in the deep south, we have a tendency to be more conservative, so we resist uh, to some degree some of this foolishness that's being taught in schools today, it still finds its way in, but not to the extent that you might see up north or in California, someplace like that. Uh, the, the Satan goes after people younger and younger and younger. However, the Lord knows who will come to him and who will not. And he is not going to leave anybody without an opportunity but he is most definitely going to make certain that those that he knows are going to come to him will hear now that's where the, the the doctrine of predestination comes in he knows so he makes makes the way that being said it does not absolve christians of the responsibility to fulfill that commission that Christ gave us before he ascended. It's our duty, and it should be our joy to go and share the gospel. If Christ is real to you, and you have that relationship with him, then your life should be changed. Why would you not want to go 
and share that with somebody else, particularly if it's somebody you care about. So, yes, even if, if, if you're teaching false doctrine, especially to one of these little ones, and the Lord knows, hey, I get the word to, to that one, you know, yes, they, they, they can still be saved. And uh, one thing that we will look at in the next week or so is the growth of apostasy, which is that false teaching, that turning away from the truth. Uh, it was foretold by the Lord that it would grow and grow and grow. And it's, it's terrible in these last days. Turn on the TV and see the, 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 the false teachers on TV that teach a feel-good health and wealth gospel, which is not what Christ said at all. Um, you look at the, the, some of the major false religions of the world today, and they actually grew out of Christianity. These were people that were educated in the Bible and in Christianity that went out and started these these false religions, uh, you know, Islam came after Christianity. The, the, the most of the followers of Islam are actually the descendants of Abraham through Ishmael, not through his the the, the covenant promised son of, of Isaac. But it, you look at the teachings of Islam, and I mean, you know, mostly the first. The Old Testament matches what they're teaching, but there's there's elements of Christianity. When you start to dig into it, you see paganism. Catholicism grew out of Christianity. They teach a history that says, you know, that we came from the Protestant Reformation, but the Baptists existed long before the Catholics did. Um, but that was a corruption of Christianity, which mixes idolatry from ancient Egypt and from some other uh, of the uh, lands there. Uh, nowhere do you see that Mary stays an eternal virgin. Nowhere do you see that we should pray to Mary or that we should pray to Peter or, or anything. It's idolatry. Nowhere does it tell us that Mary is the mother of God. She is not. She is the mother of Jesus Christ as man in the flesh. But he was God before she conceived. He's still God. She is not the mother of God. God has always been. Uh, Mormonism, Joseph Smith, supposedly he, he gets a message from uh, this angel Moroni, okay? And um, about this new gospel or this extended gospel of Christ. This is all apostasy which Jesus told us was coming and is actually, even though it seems like it's at a peak right now, it's actually going to get worse after the rapture because then the Holy Spirit is removed with the church and it's really going to get crazy. Real quick, we'll move to a couple of the other parables here. Uh, the next parable uh, we see starts in verse 31. It is the parable of mustard seed. Here again, Jesus tells us another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in his branches. What the Lord is telling us there is that my kingdom through the church on earth is going to have a small beginning. It's going to start out small. Just as the, the mustard tree starts out as this tiny little mustard seed, this tiny little speck, you know, um, even though it's going to start out small, it's going to grow into something big. It's going to grow into uh, this tree. It's going to grow into something that yields and something that produces and uh, something sturdy enough, he says, so the birds can nest in it. He, he's giving us 
uh, a look at what's going to be the progression of the church on earth. And you begin to see that when you look in the book of Acts, you know. He's got his, his disciples that followed him, uh, that uh, he appeared to many of after he had risen from the grave. Many of them saw him ascend into heaven. These guys start out in Jerusalem. The church starts out in Jerusalem. They receive the Holy Spirit. They begin to preach and teach and reach out. And you see people coming in, in large numbers. But eventually you see them spreading out. Uh, the, the book of Acts, the letters of Paul, give us uh, an insight into this where they begin to spread out through the, the known world at that time into other places, Ephesus, Galatia, Philippi, um, Thessalonica, further and further out. They're, they're reaching out to people down into Ethiopia and um, into uh, Greece. And um, the, the gospel begins to spread. And as the gospel spread, the church grows. And what do we see now when we look at where the church has gotten to? There is not a place on earth where the gospel has not reached into, where there are not believers and followers in Christ that are, that are part of his church universe. He told us this would happen. He told us this would spread out. And we have become like a, a tree now that yields fruit and that uh, so it supports the birds of the air. Uh, the Lord goes on in the next uh, verse, 33, to give us another picture of what is going to happen. And all of these things are in regards to the kingdom that's being built on earth through the uh, spread of the gospel and the growth of his church. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Now, up until now, we've seen a lot of growth and a lot of good things coming from the sowing of the gospel, but he's beginning to give us another picture of where the church is going to get to as we come to the last days. Leaven often in the scripture represents sin or iniquity. Prior to the Passover celebration, they would remove all the leaven from the house. You know, they would eat unleavened bread. That's, you know, like leaven is basically to us today is yeast. Okay, it causes the bread to rise. And yeast being a bacteria which causes a, a, you know, a fermentation process. And it represents sin often in the scripture. So what he's telling us here. Is that you know as my church is growing and getting bigger uh, there's going to be those that bring sin bring leaven into my church and um, you know when it gets in it, it could spread throughout a whole particular fellowship I have seen uh, churches that uh, people brought in false teaching uh, they brought in stuff that sounded good and looked good and the next thing you know that church uh, is either falling apart becoming ineffective for Christ or you see them uh, as we have seen right here very close to us uh, uh, they uh, a bunch of the membership goes off and starts uh, another church where you've got all this emphasis on uh, acting like you've got the Holy Spirit and he's making you speak in tongues and and run up down aisles and roll around on the floor and you know it all becomes more about emotion and action than it really is about relationship and what is uh, truly Christ and this has reached quite a, a level we see a, a local denomination um, that has allowed sin into their denomination as a whole, the United Methodist. And there is church after church that now has become ineffective as all kinds of sin, much of it uh, having to do with, with homosexuality is running rampant through their church. We're seeing some of the United Methodist churches 
filing lawsuits in order that they can separate from the uh, the, con the, the con congregation uh, as a whole of United Methodist Church become an independent operating facility because in the United Methodist Church the, the convention or association uh, 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 whatever you want to call it it, uh, it owns all the properties so some of these churches are having to you know have lawsuits that hey we want to keep the property and the building where we've been worshiping because we don't want to be affiliated with your foolishness. It, it's getting crazy. It's getting out of hand. And the Lord told us it would do. You know, if you, if you let the leaven get in, it'll leaven everything. You know, it'll turn it all, all to iniquity. So, right here, this one, it says that the Lord will send all of our typical substances, always means it in the Old Testament, and evil sins. In the New Testament, it explains symbolic meaning. It is malice and wickedness and constructive with serenity and truth. So it, in the New Testament, it's telling us that we are reading that it took it, it's taking it from the evil side of some, and now in the New Testament, it, we're showing it, that we're showing that it's wickedness or evilness, and then the New Testament says, Yeah, you look for you look for what and this is why it is so important that we be studying the scripture. And and when I say we, I don't just mean here on Sunday, y'all listening to me, and this is one reason why I try to give a lot of scripture references most uh Sundays is so that you can go and double check me so you can read these scriptures for yourself so that it takes on more meaning than just what you hear me say but that you can also double check to make certain that I am not giving you false teaching uh, but that everything I say lines up with the rest of scripture if it does not line up with the rest of scripture then you should have alarm bells going off something's not right so he gives a, uh, two par more parables that are uh, pretty similar. One of them is one verse and one of them is two verses, uh, looking at verses 44. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom of heaven, what Christ has for us, as in our individual relationship with him and it is in our collective relationship with him and each other through the church, when a person realizes its value and significance, the Lord is saying, it will be all that they want. It will be what they must have. Everything else becomes nothing compared to this. You know, the guy sells all his property to buy that land to have that treasure. Uh, the, the guy sells everything he has just for this one pearl, recognizing its value. If we're really Christians, okay, and, and this should grow as we walk through Christ, the Spirit will show us how valuable it is what the Lord is giving to us. That first value that many of us will recognize will be, hey, you know, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. He paid the price for me. He's made a way for me. I don't have to go there. That, that's the first thing that many people recognize when they come to Christ. But at, at, once we come to Christ we, and we're walking with Christ and growing in Christ, the Spirit will be showing us more and more and more of how valuable <clears throat> what He has is for us. It will become consuming uh, that we, we can be closer and closer and closer to him in relationship 
uh, we'll, we'll recognize more and more and more how we can take our cares to him and, and take our, our celebrations too uh, for the blessings that he gives us. And it will be what we want to be about, you know, being close to him, learning about him, but sharing what we're learning because we just can't help but show off what relationship with Christ means to us. And that's what he is uh, foretelling here is that, the, that when you get it, you're going to get it, you know, and there are going to be people that get it and it's going to be all in all to them. And we see that we send, uh, there's missionaries that go and, and give up everything they've got, their peace, their comforts, uh, 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 their, their, Fortunes here in the U.S., they rely on whatever they can earn on their own out there, whatever donations are sent to them. Some of these people end up losing their lives to go out on the mission field and share the gospel. Uh, but, but not just overseas. I mean, we, we send missionaries uh, here in our country. But that, they make that their whole thing because they realize the value of the kingdom of God. And they want to share that to others. Uh, that others can see that and become so consumed that you know the more consumed we become with christ the less this world should mean to us you know yes we still work because we you know it's nice to live in a house that keeps the rain and the snow off of us and we like to eat food and we need you know to get about you know these are normal things of life that we do but they're not going to be the consuming things that we worry about uh you know what's going to happen next week am i going to get laid off or no the more consumed we get with Christ, the less we're going to worry about that. The more consumed we get with Christ, the less likely we are to be led astray by the iniquities of this world. And we will see that, and we should be seeing that now, looking out, seeing people that are that consumed with, with, with Christ. And as Christians, we should be wanting to become more and more consumed with Christ. <clears throat> Then the, the last parable in this chapter that uh, we want to look at is uh, starting in verse 47, where Jesus is continuing to speak, and he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good in the vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age and angels will come forth separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is kind of similar in a sense to the parable of the wheat and tares in the sense that evil, false things can be mixed in with our church. But in this case, we've got a picture, you know, these guys are out casting out a dragnet. They're out seeing who they can bring into Christ, okay? And invariably, you'll get some things in your dragnet that, that are not worth keeping. Um, invariably, the more we open up to our communities, drawing people into the fellowship, trying to bring people to Christ, we're going to get some, some people that can be problems. Um, but the thing I want to really focus on here is yet another prophecy of the end times. He says, so it will be at the end of the age. We've got Christ, if you're paying attention, you're telling us what's coming. What's coming is that he is going to come and collect us, to collect what belongs to him, what's valuable to him those of us that belong to him. And he will separate out what doesn't belong to him. And what doesn't belong to him, it says, is cast into the furnace of fire, wailing and gnashing of teeth. What doesn't belong to him is going to receive judgment. But the big thing to focus on there is that he is guaranteeing here to come and get us and receive us back to himself. So it's amazing where you see prophecies of, of end time 
and, and don't let your mind just jump right to the book of Revelation or Ezekiel or Daniel because the Lord himself walking the earth told us a lot about what to look for and what was coming. And the big thing is that I really like is the assurance that, hey, he's going to receive us back to himself. Okay? He has basically, through his prophecies here, and then his prophecies in chapter 24, set the stage for what is happening right this moment and what is happening imminently. Like I said, I wake up every day surprised we're still here. I really do. Any thoughts or questions before we head upstairs? All right, well, let's go worship. Talk to Kathy. She said it must have been his understanding.